Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC Fight Night, uh, Lewis versus Nascimento for Saturday, May 10th. And this is going to be what I like to just call the, the best plays video. Um, we're going to be doing three completely separate videos. One, uh, which is this one, just who the best DFS plays are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about leverage, but not that much, although it's kind of hard to avoid on this slate. Um, there's some very obvious leverage spots that we're going to go over here. Um, then we're going to do a contrarian betting breakdown, which is tomorrow, which is a lot of fun. You know, we try to identify who everybody agrees on as being the best plays as far as betting goes and bet against them pretty much. Basically try to teach you guys how to think a little bit more critically about the betting markets. And then uh, Saturday morning, we're probably going to do a live uh, try to do it live, but it's certainly going to be a lineup construction video where we're completely focused not on who the best plays are, but what the best lineups are, specifically what lineups are best suited to flat out win the 150K in the big uh, MME contest on DraftKings. And as you'll see from watching these videos enough, there's just quite a difference between uh, who the best plays are and who to actually play, you know, specifically for those types of contests. We'll make good use of the sims and the, the different tools available to us. But today we're just going to focus in on just who the best plays are given the metrics. And as usual, I mean, it's pretty to pretty easy to identify like, who the best plays are. Um, and in this particular card, there is quite a large dichotomy between the fights that you should be targeting and the fights you should be avoiding, uh, excuse me, and the fights you should be avoiding. And there's some very, very obvious high metrics underdogs that are going to stand out. And again, that doesn't mean you have to play them all because if, if I'm noticing that they stand out, then everybody else is, and they're going to be pretty high owned uh, relative to their chances of winning and et cetera. Uh, but that's going to, we're going to save a little bit of that for the third video, but there are some very obvious bits of leverage that we're going to get to be, and we really should spend a little time on those because it's an important lesson. Uh, they, they represent very important lessons on how to play DFS in general, but specifically those types of uh, contests where you have, you know, direct leverage, like one, one thing happening or a diff or another thing happening, you know, that's what they're completely negatively correlated, whether it be two people playing tennis against each other, two people fight against each other, things like that. Okay. So let's just get started. JJ Aldridge versus Veronica Hardy. This is, clearly one of the fights to avoid. Neither fighter has particularly great line value uh, relative to their price. Neither one has particularly good uh, inside the distance line, uh, either plus 400 or plus 700. And neither one has particularly great uh, wrestling upside. So as far as the metrics go, this, this fight is just a complete fade. Jared Gordon versus Kevin Gisset. Um, Kevin just said he's minus 230. His price is 9,200. And for that type of price, you better you better have a real strong inside the distance line, especially on a card like this, for reasons we'll get to later. But when you look into it, I mean, he's, his inside the distance line is only like plus 170, which is extremely poor. And his grappling upside, which, you know, he does have some, it's not as much of a lock as some of the other, you know, grapplers there are out there so you need to have that parlay of number one him actually going for the takedowns and the number two of them being successful and given his inside the distance line his price and all that stuff i don't think that's enough uh jared gooden's interesting i mean on the other side he had only 7k has a very very respectable inside the distance line of plus 350 and like we're going to get to another guy pretty shortly that has a very similar inside the distance line is probably going to be a little bit more popular than gooden so um, you want to take a shot at Gooden in, in, in MME, you know, definitely 20 max or higher. Yeah, that's fine. But it's certainly not uh, you know, elite play and certainly not as good as some of the under, other underdogs, which are going to be extremely obvious that we're going to get to uh, soon. Charles Johnson versus Jake Hadley. Just a whole lot of nothing here. I mean, you have... You might be able to argue for a little bit of line value, I guess, with Charles Johnson. I mean, it's it's a minus 130 fight, given Vig. So I guess technically you should it should be more like 8,400, 7,800. So maybe it's a little bit of line value with Charles Johnson. But the thing is that 
Neither of these fighters have particularly strong inside the distance lines. Johnson plus 500, Hadley plus 300 as the favorite. So in the absence of huge grappling or takedown upside, this fight's going to be a fade. So that's what this fight is probably going to be. All right, Trey Waters versus Billy Goff. Um, I think this is a, this fight's going to be, I, I think this fight's sort of sneaky, but that's that's more of a, uh, I guess it's more of an ownership thing, but I mean, we'll talk about it. So, so Trey Waters, he's minus 160 to win. So with Vic, it's like minus 150. And his uh, his price is his price eighty eight hundred. I guess that's reasonable, right? That's reasonable win odds. And at eighty eight hundred, you really need an inside the distance line of about plus one ten to be a pretty good play. And he actually has an inside the distance line of of. I mean, he's right in the game, you know, plus one ten, plus one fifteen. So it's certainly reasonable. It just. Just doesn't have any takedown upside to go with it. It just feels like a guy that's just going to keep Billy Goff at range and maybe picks him apart and gets a late finish. But the, I don't know about this. This is when I first looked at this, I, I thought it'd be a could be a good low owned pivot off of some of the more obvious plays in this, you know, with these metrics. But I guess it's just a fade. I don't know. Uh, one thing I will say is the other side of this. Billy Goff, his inside the distance line is a, is like plus 300. And that's, that's the guy I alluded to earlier when I was talking about Gooden. So Billy Goff, it's like plus three, 350 or whatever it is, plus 300. And Gooden is pretty much the same. Where was Gooden? Plus like 350, maybe a little worse. But Goff is going to make a lot more sense to people because number one, in his last fight, he was very aggressive. He gets a bunch of, he, he's a, he's a finisher. He's very, you know, he puts up a lot of volume. He's the type of guy you want to play as opposed to Trey Waters. who's not a, really the type of guy you want to play. Trey Waters, the big long guy with, you know, the, the long reach that doesn't really, it's not really the sexy type of guy to play in on, on DraftKings where Billy Goff, the shorter guy that'll get in the, get in your face and just rack up points like that is, is a lot more appealing. So he's probably, I think that, I mean, the more I think about the Billy Goff play, I think he's going to end up being higher owned than maybe he could be or should be. But, I mean, his metrics are fine. You know, plus 300 at, you know, what's his price here? At 7,400. And that's certainly reasonable. There, there are better plays, though. But I think that Goff is, is certainly one of the underdogs people should, should get to. But I don't think he's the priority. Tisha Torres versus Tabitha Ritchie. Now, one thing I should have mentioned, I guess, about the Aldridge fight was that it is that mid-range 8,200 8K fight, which, I mean, should be respected, you know, because because whenever you can somehow get someone from that, you know, range in, it just makes your lineups, you know, flow a lot easier. So you got to give a, a little extra look to that range. And uh, this Tabitha Ricci fight is, is one of them. So this is kind of hard to explain, but if you start building lineups by hand with what – I consider the obvious plays on the, on this, you know, this slate. Um, you're going to get to a point where you're going to want to play Tabitha Ricci. And it's kind of hard to, to, to explain without you having do, to, without you doing it, but, but try to build like 20 lineups on your own. After you see this video and all the other ones that are going to recommend the same guys pretty much. Um, and, and try to build them without Tabitha Ricci and then try to build them with Tabitha Ricci. And, and you'll see that, if you can get Tabitha Ritchie in there, it makes every it gives you more options. I mean, significantly more options of the of the guys and girls or whatever that you want to play than to not use her. So what we're gonna try to do is like reverse engineer whether you know Tabitha Ritchie is a good player or not, because I want her to be a good player. Because if she can get her in, it, it does open up a lot of things for you. Uh the thing is, you know what you're getting with Tabitha Ritchie. I mean, you, you, she's gonna be her striking's okay. She's going to be going for takedowns. And when she gets them, she's going to basically take what she's given. You know, if she, if she has the opportunity to get a submission, she'll get it, but she's not going to go, you know, all out for it. If she feels it's better off to control her opponent, if in fact she gets the takedowns in the first place, she'll do that too. Um, 
So her upside, her ceiling is is not. I mean, it's not amazing, but it's not bad either. You know, like so. So here's the deal: like if you're going to play Tabitha Ritchie, you're going to have to be content with you know, like one of these, like this eighty six or this ninety three. Like you can't play her and then expect to get this second round submission with the four takedowns and five minutes of control time with 123 points. That's just not really, I mean, it's in her range of outcomes, but it's not in her, in her usual range of outcomes. Um, so if you're content with that, if you, you know, a, a, and, and you accept the fact that if she wins, you know, you're going to need 85, 86 to get in the optimal. Uh, I think she is, she, I think she is a very reasonable player. Uh, the problem with her opponent is, unfortunately, there's just no metrics for her. She, she, I mean, they're not good. She doesn't have really a lot of line value. She has Torres, her inside the distance line's poor, and she has no takedown upside. The only thing I would say is that, given what I just said about Tabitha Ricci, the fact that getting her in lineups makes lineups flow a little better, I think because of that, She's going to get a little more ownership than than you might think, which means that Torres might get a little more leverage than maybe you might think. So when you get to 150 max and you really start to, to pile them in there, then, yeah, Torres is somebody that you might want to – it's kind of a sneaky play. Um, but uh, I do think that Richie's like very, very solid. All right, Terrence McKinney versus Esteban Rubovich. So this is, again, this is a very – very obvious, yet yeah, yeah, very, you know, it's an important to, to highlight, uh, underdog on the slate. You have Terrence McKinney, who's, you know, plus 150 or so. First of all, even just money line value. I mean, if you knew nothing else, he's 7,300 at plus 150, which is sort of ridiculous. But not not, <laughs> not even that. You, you His inside the distance line is, is like plus 200. You know, uh, he just finishes – all of his fights and usually in the first round. So at his price tag, this is just, uh, you know, I call it a theoretical lock because obviously he's, he only wins the fight 40% of the time, but, but you, you factor that in the, the inside of this line, plus the fact that he, if you believe everybody that you're listening to his best path, path to victory is actually also going for takedowns. So if you could get takedowns alongside of your finishing upside and all this stuff. So, so it's, um, He's a very clear play, and uh, I imagine a whole bunch of people are going to be playing. Um, so, uh, with that said, th this is kind of a theme that we're going to we're going to highlight the next couple of fights. It is pretty important, and I did say we're not going to go into lineup construction too much. But whenever you have a fighter whose metrics are so obvious, uh, and everybody's going to play him as a result, you should consider whether his opponent is is also reasonable. Um, just to get some leverage off of that, off of that play. So, like Rebovich himself is obviously a very very strong play in his own way. He's he, hell. He's minus one thirty inside the distance at his price of eighty what eighty nine hundred something like that. I mean that's certainly that's that's really really good. So, uh, all this is a way of saying that both sides of this fight are you know very very viable. And but don't don't you know sleep on the Rebovich side of this because McKinney is going to be a very popular underdog and Rebovich has good you know good metrics in his own right and you get a little sneaky leverage uh, by doing that so uh, by playing him uh, so that's kind of like like the introductory lesson we're going to get to the the, the main course in, in, a, in a few fights here uh, Borshev versus Chase Hooper um, you could get. You could go drive yourself crazy trying to figure out, you know, whether Borshev is going to get the takedowns or not. Excuse me, whether Hooper's going to get the takedowns or not, whether Borshev will keep it on the feet or not. And yes, I mean, obviously, if, if Borshev lets himself get grappled, he's probably going to lose. And if Hooper cannot get the grappling going, he's probably he's probably going to lose. So don't 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 try to predict that. Right there, the, the, the fact is the way statistics work. There's a certain chance that Borshev is going to keep it on the feet. There's a certain chance that Hooper is going to get it to the mat. And the odds on that happening are pretty much what the win odds are. In other words, I would say about 
55% of the time, Borshev keeps it on the feet and does not get into a grappling match. And 55 and 45% of the time, Hooper gets what he wants and gets some grappling going. So that that's all you have to worry about. Okay. And then what happens when those things happen? So you'll look at the inside the distance line, first of all, of Borshev and, and his inside the, inside the distance line for an $8,500 fighter or whatever is really, really strong. I mean, you're talking about, you know, plus 105 maybe inside the distance for a fighter who is 8,500. That's, that's extremely good. Uh, and then on the other side of this, you have Hooper who, I mean, his inside the distance line is, is, is okay. Right. He's plus 220. Um, he's plus 220. His price is, is, uh, 7700 which is you know for up uh, 220 inside the distance line that's that's pretty good it's however um don't don't be surprised if if some of hooper's finishes do not get him into the optimal lineup um and again that's more for you know other discussions but you know he's got plus 220 inside but of that plus 220 i think a good amount of them are are situations where he got into grappling without getting a takedown and getting a sub without getting any significant strikes off, you know? So it's, um, that's the thing with these guys that, that, that whose path to victory or it's mostly submissions. They don't usually get all too many of those significant strikes. So I think his ceiling is a little bit lower than people are, uh, might be modeling for. So I'll just leave it at that. Certainly a good play for no other reason than Borshev looks like a great play and Hooper's fighting against him. But Hooper in a, in a you know in his own right, uh, you know, so many of his wins involve submissions and, and that kind of thing that I think he's pretty good too. Okay. Uh if you watch nothing else in this video, you will watch the breakdown of this next fight and and you'll go back to it in whenever you want to, you know talk about MME, whatever you want to talk about MMA, MME, or MME DFS. It's, it's a really important point here. So let's take a look at the Robelis de Spain versus Waldo, Waldo Corsta, Cortez Acosta fight. And what I want to do is I want to look at it. Let's first take a look at, a, at, at Cortez Acosta before anything else. So Waldo Cortez Acosta, his price is... 7200 okay. For a $7,200 fighter, for him to be a good GPP play, his inside the distance line needs to be about a plus 350. You know, we talked about that with Goff. We talked about that with Gooden, for example. And you look at Costa, Costa, whatever, Cortez Acosta, his inside the distance line is plus about 220. For, for 7200 that's insane. Okay. Uh, and likewise, uh, you know, we just we just talked about Chase Hooper. Him, he has the same inside the distance line of seventy seven hundred. Okay, um, you compare him to say Billy Goff. Billy Goff, we talked about people might want to play his inside the distance line is like plus three hundred. So if Waldo Cortez Acosta at plus two twenty uh, is a, it's an amazing play. Like the only underdog that I feel is better relative to his inside the distance line is probably McKinney. Um, and now what have I told you that, that it, given everything I just said, Cortez Acosta is going to be about 15% on like extremely low owned relative to his metrics. You would say, well, that's impossible, but no, it's not. And this is why like now we'll take a look at his opponent. So Robeles Despanya. Okay, forget forget who he is. Forget what you saw. Forget about all that. Okay, yes, he's six seven. He's a monster. He's he's, he's taekwondo medalist and, and this that, all that and the other thing. And he's finished all six of his fights in like thirty seconds. But forget that. Let's look at his metrics. His metrics look amazing. Okay, Despagne is only nine k, and his inside the distance line is minus like one seventy. That's that's amazing. That's 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 even better than. Than Rebovich, but even more to the point, look, look at look at his inside the distance. Look at his round one prop. He's basically a pick'em to finish in the first round at nine k. 
So this, these metrics for Despagne are just amazing. And they're so awesome and so amazing that everybody knows it. Everybody's going to be playing it. And as a result, this is why you'll be able to get Waldo Cortez Acosta, despite his incredible metrics and only 15% ownership. Okay. And this is a really important point with DFS MMA. When MMA DFS, when you have these guys going against each other, if you remember nothing else, find the fighter with the best metrics on the slate, the best metrics that everybody can see, and then see if his or her opponent has even reasonable metrics. Because the leverage you're going to get against that obvious fighter is extreme. And if you could support that with even decent metrics, that's the way you're supposed to play MMA DFS. Um, and so Waldo Cortez Acosta is a just really like the archetype example of what you're supposed to do if you were going to play GPPs in UFC. Now, again, doesn't mean he's not going to get knocked out in the first 19 seconds. Certainly possible. I would say almost probable. But when you're when you're analyzing this thing from a theoretical perspective and you're trying to learn how this all works, this is the type of guy that you want to play. You want to play Waldo Cortez Acosta. Yes, you probably want to play Despagne also, but it's in a weird way even more important that you make sure you get some Cortez Acosta in. Okay, because this is the type of leverage that 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 you have to be able to you have to be able to understand and fire without worrying about it. You know. Um, okay, Alex Caceres, Sean Woodson, uh, total fade. Uh, Sean Woodson, he's over 9K and he's plus 400 inside. There's no takedown to speak of either side. This fight's a pass. Mateus Rebecki versus Carlos Diego Fierfeja. Again, I'm not going to get into my, my views on this fight. Although I will say that, <laughs> you know, I'm going to say this one thing. About this fight, and I'll let you make your own decision. You can find footage of basically all of Carlos Diego Fajaya's fights, prayer fights, and not even the fights from when he was younger. I mean, even like the last two or three fights. All I'll say is this. If you watch those fights, you're not going to want to play anybody against them at 9,400. Um, you're just not going to want to. Um, you're not going to want to lay 400 against him, almost no matter who he's fighting. Uh, he, he's he's a lot of experience. He doesn't look particularly washed. He's he's looks he looks like he fights hard. Even his loss to Gamrod, if you pull that up, I mean, he got he didn't even get really knocked out. He got hurt. And uh, I don't know, but not not nonetheless, you do have Rebecca as the biggest favorite on the card by a lot. And his inside the distance line is very strong. He's minus 130 or so inside the distance. He's minus 500 to win or minus 350 to win, whatever. Not to mention he's got all this takedown upside. So, I mean, he's, you know, one of the best plays, if not the best play on the slate. And you can get to him pretty easily with the, with the underdogs we've talked about and are going to talk about. Um, I will say this, in MME, you, you better get – I don't know. I think you better get some of the Diego for, hey, even if you force him in. I'm telling you, this guy's, what, what do I know? But just just the hashtag eye test, whatever. I mean, I I, I, I have two fights. I see three fights of Rebecca's, one against Fiore, which Fiore is awful. And Rebecca, you know, gassed in the third round. He was great against Raz about low week. That's for sure. He was awesome. And then his last fight, first round, armbar, whatever. And then the rest of his career, we have no idea who's fighting. So. Uh, but according to the metrics, he's a very strong play, if not the best play. So there's that. Alonzo Menafield versus Carlos Ulberg. Um, all right. So Ulberg, 92, 9,300. He better have at least minus 120 or so inside the distance. And yeah, he's got it, right? Um, Ulberg inside minus 125 ish with big. That's actually not bad. That's actually pretty good. Um, so why is he not really popular? Well, I mean, doesn't 
really give off the impression of somebody that's going to be that aggressive. I mean, he's got all the technical advantages and, and Menafield, he's probably going to be coming, you know, he's, he's always very aggressive and it's possible that Ober just tries to stay away from him for a while. So he figures him out. Um, so that type of approach is not, it's very, very good for winning, but it's not particularly good for DraftKings scoring. So I would say that Uberg again in 150 max sure, but I think as a priority, I wouldn't play him. And uh, and Menafield on the other side of this, I mean, his inside of distance line is plus 340. I mean, that's fine, but if you're going to do that, may as well just play Acosta with all the leverage and and all that stuff. And the, I mean, who's to say you can't play both? All right, so now we have this fight, which has become like a money line. The money line shit show. You have you have jo Joaquin Buckley against Nur Sultan Rizaboev, and this line has been crashing all week. It's almost pick them now. So what you have is Joaquin Buckley at 8,700 versus Rizaboev, who's 7,500, who's almost pick them. Not to mention the fact that Rizaboev, he has an inside the distance line of what is this? My, of like plus 220. You know, we talked about, a, a, you know, Cortez Acosta, you know, plus 220 at 7,200. Uh, you have Ruzaboa, who's just, you know, a little bit more, 7,500, but the same inside the distance line. And he also has takedown upside. So uh, extremely strong play. I think that he's going to be pretty popular. I think, listen, between him and McKinney, these are just extreme. We'll, we'll get to the main event in a second. But these are extremely obvious underdogs to play, okay? They can, both of them have money line value. Both of them have upside. You know what I mean? And when I see this, the more I see this, the more I really am into this Cortez Acosta play. God help me. Same prices, you know. You're not going to play all three of them. You want to know why you wouldn't play all three of them? Because I, I don't even like these other guys up here, like, Olberg, Jasset, Woodson, who needs it? Can't play Despagne if you have him anyway. So what are you, what are you doing here? You play Rebecca, Olberg, and, and Jasset? Yeah, sure, you could. But you'll end up, you'll, you'll end up, uh, well, what will you end up if you did that? Well, you don't get to play the main event, I guess. Anyway, um, speaking of which, well, hold on, before we even get on to this. So here's kind of a very interesting dynamic. And it's hard to explain without you doing it yourself. But first of all, I just mentioned that, Ru that uh, Ruzaboa, very, very strong money line value, good inside the distance line. So he's going to be popular. So we have to think about whether we want to play Joaquin Buckley. Now, again, with, as far as money line goes, we certainly wouldn't want to play an 87, you know, was he 87? Uh an $8,700 guy who's like minus, who's like basically picking him minus 120. But let's take a look at his inside the distance line. Um, inside, mm, about pick them. See, that's pretty good. And when you factor in the leverage against, uh, you know, what I think is going to be pretty popular, Rosa Boab, I think Buckley's worth playing. And here's the other thing I was going to mention. It's kind of hard to explain without you doing it. I think that Buckley is even going to be lower on than he could be. And the reason for that is just the way lineups build. I'll just say this. Build like 25 lineups on your own. Build 20 lineups with the obvious plays we're going to get in the main event too that we talked about. Like with the McKinney, Rizabo, the McKinney, Rizabovich, the, the Borsha fight, the um, uh, uh, put Rebecca in there, whatever, Despagne put him in. And see what lineups look like with Buckley you're not going to want to play it. And, and I can't quite, think, you know, explain to you how that's going to work, but, but just do it yourself. You'll end up having to play guys like, um, like Charles Johnson, you know, uh, or, 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 um, or Hooper maybe, or maybe even Caceres. You, you'll see. So if you do want to play Buckley, I think he'll end up being lower owned than you might think. And for when the, the ownership projections come out, I think that whatever they are on Buckley, they are going to end up being lower. 
So you could include that as, you know, if you want to bump down ownership projections from what, before you run your Sims, I think, I think that's something you can think about. So main event, Nascimento versus Lewis. So if you missed, you know, lesson one, you know, the intro, which was talking about the, uh, what was it, the, Mc the McKinney fight or whatever. Um, if you missed the main event lesson, meaning the, the description of why Cortez Acosta was a great play, here is kind of like the review, and that's Nascimento, Derek Lewis. So you look at Derek Lewis, he's 8,400. And first of all, he's like minus 150 or so to win. So he might even have a little money line value, but forget that. His inside the distance line is minus 140 at 8,400. That is the definition of just an amazing metrics, Okay. Uh, not to mention that a lot of that in the first round. So uh, Derek Lewis is an extreme, it's like an elite play on the metrics. So what do we do, right? What do we do when we see Derek Lewis, totally elite play? What do we do when we see, um, what's his name? Uh, Despagne, totally elite play. What do we do when we see McKinney, totally elite play? You, you, you ask yourself, what does his opponent look like? What are his metrics? And are they decent even? Well, let's take a look. So Nascimento, he's plus 145. You know, his line is priced okay. But Nascimento inside the distance is plus 170. Okay? We talked about, you know, Hooper, uh, uh, Ruzaboev, other guys, or whatever it is, that none of those guys had an inside the distance line like this, right? His inside the distance line, what did I say? Plus, hold on. Inside of this is plus like 170. Nobody of his price has this except except McKinney. McKinney's cheaper, obviously. In addition to that, Nascimento might actually even get some takedowns here. So, yes, Lewis is an amazing play. All the more reason, right, for why everybody's going to play him, or probably everybody should play him, which means that if you play Nascimento, who's a perfectly fine play, you're going to get some really good leverage. So we didn't really want to talk too much about lineup construction, but it's just so important that if you want to, if you want to be contrarian, this is what you're going to do. You're going to start your lineups with Nascimento, Cortez Acosta. I was about to say Rebovich only because um, – think that McKinney's going to be really popular and Rebovich as well. And then the last one, who do we say? Oh, right. So, and then like Buckley. Okay. So if you wanted to get a real contrarian, and the, all these are good plays. Okay. You fade Lewis, Despagne, and McKinney and Ruzaboev. You start with all this, then you can really, I mean, you can play a lot of, a lot of shit. Okay. Um, and look, there's a reason why Lewis is a great play, a reason why Despagne is a good play, a reason why McKinney is a good play, a reason why Rizabos is a good play. But these are the guys that you've got to get a lot of, I think, in the, especially in the big GPPs, which we'll get to more of on Saturday. That'll do it. Good luck, everybody.